Hey guys, welcome to another edition of my pool plan video and in this video I'll be covering my plans and thoughts on the upcoming banners where both Aries and Quina will be the featured characters. As always, you can look on the left hand side of the slide to see which events these are and this image is cropped from the World Authors Global Forecast over on Reddit. I will of course also be including the link to the full forecast so do check it out if you want further help in your planning. Firstly, a quick look on how I did on the last few banners and on this slide I'll be covering how I did over on Rubicante's and Kurosami's event. I went in hard on Rubicante's banner with tickets because I really had a whole lot of tickets that were about to expire back then. Unfortunately, even with the free multi draws and 600 tickets, I only managed to get few copies of his FR and no BT. I was thinking a little bit about it but I decided to just bite the bullet and use 50 BT tokens there to redeem his BT, which is a bit of a tough decision because those were sort of almost my last BT tokens. I think now if I were to redeem all the BT tokens from Dimensions N, uh, and use some of them from my premium mock pass, like maybe have like 30 or so, but that's about it. Rubicante is worth it though, and if you haven't pulled for him, I would strongly recommend to consider at least two. But one thing to note is that if you do pull for him, you must get his PT as well. A lot of his damage comes from the fact that his PT aura allows him counter Firaga, and that's two thirds of his counter damage in one so you must get his PT if you want to you know do stuff like Rubicante solos. I skipped Yuna's banner, I already did have a PT and I did get one copy of an FR while I pulled for Rubicante so I guess it's not a total loss. I didn't really build Yuna, don't really have a lot of interest in her and she still doesn't have false echoes as well. So easy skip for me. Coming to Kurasame's event I honestly didn't have a lot of interest in Kurasami and the funny thing though is that RNG works in mysterious ways because on the free multi on Kurasami's event, one of the free multis gave me both one copy of his, of his BT and one copy of his FR so didn't really need to spend any resource there I did throw 30 tickets as you can see on the slide but that's really because the hunt shop closed down and I had 30 hunt tokens to redeem so you know, might as well just get it for free and then redeem back the 30 hunt tokens. Didn't really get anything out of the 30 tickets though but hey you know I got his FR and BT. Kurosame's BT is only a 0 out of 3. I didn't fully green him because I wanted to save the ingots but I did max out his FR with high power stones. Seed Reigns did also make an appearance here and for me this is an easier skip not because he's bad but because I already have Seed Reigns fully built so didn't have to pull on this banner. For those still watching and if the banner is still up, if you don't have Seed Reigns at all, I would strongly recommend to pull at least for his LD just to get access to his LD call ability because it is one of the best call abilities in the game but more importantly it is the only call ability that allows the caller to launch every single turn in BT mode which is of very high value in the current Shinryu era. Overall I spent 630 tickets and 50 BT tokens which I guess is quite okay I was expecting to spend more and at least I did manage to save my gems because it is going to be used in the next few banners. Alright, so finally jumping into it, the first event that we will get is finally Act 4, Chapter 1.1 and hey I'm very excited for the new chapter in GL. This is also one of the notorious fights because it features the Hell House boss which is known for being a little bit tricky at least compared to recent fights. Anyway on this event, Iris will get a rerun of her FR because her FR isn't new but we do get a new PT weapon for Ares and a new FR weapon for Zack which is the secondary featured character. Not though however that Zack BT is a rerun, he had his BT previously released. First off, 
there's a lot of info that I wanted to cover here, so I'll split it across two slides, and I'll start first on this slide talking about Ares. Ares is getting sort of like a mild rework here, and it's not that bad because her kit is actually already pretty good. On her rework, Ares' follow-up attack from having her LD buff is now increased in potency, so the number of HP dumps is still the same as it was before, but the overall potency is higher, making meaning that it's easier for her to cap out her damage on her follow-up attack. If you do her HP attack seal evil, which is the HP attack variant that she gets after using her LD, that attack now also has 20% splash, so it does a little bit more damage. On top of this, her EX buff now also gives herself an additional HP damage plus 20%. Iris gets a new PT weapon here, and I must say her PT weapon is really loaded. Now there's been a little bit of discussion I was having with other content creators about how required a PT weapon is, and I guess for one thing, it is potentially possible to make do with an Ares without a BT weapon, but you'll be losing really a ton of utility from not having her BT. And I guess spoilers, this is the main reason why I am pulling. I already did have Ares's FR at 3 out of 3, but I think her BT is worth it. So what does her BT actually do? When you use her BT, for one thing, it fully revives and heals the entire party, up to 120% of their max HP. That's right, it overheals everyone in your party. When you use a BT as well, it grants Ares herself a 4 turn gold framed buff. While this buff is up, everyone in your party will take 100% less HP damage and brave damage. Essentially, it is a form of damage mitigation that comes in a gold framed buff. The BT also gives Ares a new overhead that looks like her trademark holy or pearl material. The way that this overhead works is sort of like a cross between Charlotta and Garnet's overhead. So for one thing, it will store any HP healing that Ares does up to a maximum of 200,000. Anytime a character X, the counter will increase by 1 and when it reach, reaches 3 counters or 3 stacks, it will unleash the healing start, which is usually maxed out at 200,000 as HP damage. Once unleashed, the value doesn't go down, it just remains, so it shouldn't be very hard to hit the 200,000 cap and maintain it, especially you know, if you're using Ares anyway. I kinda like it, I mean it doesn't do a great deal of damage, but it is free damage and it is a further contribution to Ares' role as, a, as an aura bot support, at least now, you know, on top of the, all the auras that she provides, you also get a little bit of damage thrown in as well. Importantly though, and this is actually very interesting, her BT aura has the unique mechanic where it doesn't have a, a fixed duration of turns. When you use Ares' BT aura, it lasts all the way until an enemy attack brings one of your party members below 50% health. This is very similar to how Aiko's Phoenix is triggered, if you are familiar with Aiko's kit. When this is triggered, her BT will automatically heal and revive the entire party to 120% max HP once more, but it will dispel the BT aura right after that. This is both good and bad. The good thing is that you know it lasts until someone's HP drops below 50% from an attack, Essentially means that if no attack brings someone below 50% HP, it lasts the entire fight. Not forgetting also that her BT gives her the gold framed buff that mitigates damage. So at the very least, it should last at least until the gold frame buff goes away. But in most fights, it can't really last practically from the start of the fight until the very end. This is quite relevant because her BT aura also gives additional aura auras to the party. And this is Brave Damage and Brave Cap Up plus 30%, Brave Gains a Whopping plus 50%, HP Damage plus 20%, and HP Healing Cap plus 20%. So everyone can really be healed until 120% of their max HP. Ares also, of course, gets access to her Force Bots and Force Echoes. And her Force Echoes is notable. For one thing, her Echoes is one of those 
that doesn't deal damage but initially starts at 150, 150% force gauge. When you use her echoes, it is guaranteed to plus 80% at least the force gauge bonus and will be higher than 80% if her echoes also fulfills some of the conditionals. So for example, if you happen to have your main FR require a conditional such as healing, or maybe your main FR is someone like Penelo's FR which is very generic, Aries's Echoes will give plus 80% plus whatever conditionals the main FR is, which means that Aries's FR is pretty massive as a force gauge bonus supercharger. On top of this, Aries's FR is instanted, so it is extremely easy for her to just use double Echoes right near the start of your force time and instantly give you a very sizable force bonus percentage. That being said, I've also included Aries's force conditionals uh, right on the slide here in case you need a refresher. And I must say, her force conditionals is pretty niche and not very good if you're using it as a main FR. I think which was one of the, her weaknesses uh, before the Echoes era. Now overall, my thoughts on Aries is that I think she's really very strong. She's always been pretty strong as an aura bot support, but she sort of fell off a little bit when characters started getting BT weapons and force echoes. Now Aries also has access to it. Her kit allows her to function as an aura bot support, allows her to charge the force gauge at the start with both her S1 and S2. She can also pass her turn using her S2 if you remove her S2 passive. She's always been a great healer of course, and now she also gets access to additional auras through her BT. Her BT has that very um, unique utility I guess in terms of both damage mitigation, additional damage, and party protection from the BT aura. And she's also excellent as a Force Echoes user. On top of this, she also has the very nifty utility that will come in very handy in the Hell House fight where she, her LD debuff, I should say, prevents enemies from granting themselves new buffs. And very importantly as well, her buff allows the party 100% debuff evasion, as long as the, the debuff is not a guaranteed hit. She really brings in quite a lot of both utility and auras all in one character. And my opinion really is she's a good pickup regardless if you are a new or veteran player. For me, I really put a lot of value on her BT weapon, so even though I already do have her FR, I am going in straight with gems to score her BT. If I have to PT her BT, so be it, because I really don't have enough BT tokens as of now, but of course I hope to score her BT relatively early. Next up is Zack. Zack also gets a rework, and his rework is a little bit more than Aries's because his kit is currently also a little bit more outdated. His S1 and S2 gets a damage rework in terms of HP dumps and potency. Interestingly, his S2, his Rush Assault, will now trigger Chain Slash if it is targeting an enemy that is happening to happen to target Zack. His LD also gets a damage rework and now provides stronger stat boosts and his EX also um, now has a stronger potency and has a little bit more stats tied to it as well. Zack gets a new FR which does melee damage and when you use it, it inflicts 4 turn lock on all enemies and also provides the party 6 turns Brave Barrier buff. During Zack's force time, if you are attacking an enemy that is targeting yourself, you get a bonus HP damage and HP damage cap up plus 50% which is really very nice. So that being said, you know, unless the enemy is targeting all, it's likely that mainly only Zack will benefit from this due to his lock-on debuff. Zack's force conditionals are also on this slide. Firstly, he has one conditional that gives you plus 20% during an enemy's turn, which is if you were to absorb or reduce any brave damage taken, you get plus 20%. Next up, you get plus 40% if you happen to recover HP during your turn. And finally, you get plus 40% if you are targeting an enemy, targeting yourself. 
this is actually pretty decent overall, uh, especially if you have Zach's PT and you're utilizing Zach's PT mode. Zach is always sort of like a hybrid between a tank and a DPS. His BT aura provides him some tanking capabilities, but as a tank, he actually does surprisingly good damage overall. And the fact that his force time actually is suited to his kit makes sure that you know, he continues to deal pretty good damage during his force time. I don't have sex PT, and really my plan here is to skip even though I feel he's pretty decent. The thing about Zack though is that for one thing, you know, you need to invest heavily in him if you really want his true potential, which yes, can be said for all characters, but here I already plan to pull for Ares and you know, if I were to also pull for Zack's PT, that's going to be a huge hit on my resources. Beyond that also, I can't really think of a situation where I will want to bring Zack, which sounds pretty odd, but the point is that while he does decent job in both tanking and DPS, most of the time you know, I would rather bring either a dedicated tank like Rubicante or a dedicated DPS unit. It's very rarely that I want both in one character. And Rubicante being just released also means it's very poor timing for Zack. Rubicante is currently now the premier tank in global and if you do want a tank, you'll likely be better served bringing Rubicante along which means then you don't really need Zack for tanking capabilities. And that means then you can you know, provide the party slot to a dedicated DPS unit instead. Plus, speaking to the poor timing, Zack is released at a time when there's quite a lot of popular units that's about to come out. And you know, if you are low on resources such as PT ingots and such, such as for myself as well, then you know you need to make some sacrifices here and there and ultimately I think Zack is the easiest character in the month of May to drop. Next event also features a very popular character and the next event will be Act 4 Chapter 1.2 and there will be two banners here, the first featuring a new character in the form of Quina and the second will feature a rerun of Kamla Nod's FRMBT. Now I'm not even going to talk about Kamla Nod because he has nothing new. His FR and BT were released very early in the Shinryu era and he doesn't actually get his force boss or even a rework here. So there's really not a lot of reason to pull for him. Um, his you know, FR conditional requires launch and even with that, it doesn't provide anything more than what we currently have on a usual basis. So there's really not a lot of reason to bring Kamla Nod. Kuina though, on the other hand, is a very interesting character. Now the first thing I need to at least cover here is Kuina's frog overhead, which is on the right hand side. He starts the battle with an overhead that looks like a frog, and this can stack up to 10 stacks. Kuina gets one stack at the start of the quest, he gets one additional stack after taking a turn, or one stack when he breaks an enemy. For each stack that Quina gets, the party gets plus 2% attack, initial brave and max brave, so at 10 stacks that's plus 20%. On top of this, Quina gets an additional 20% at 10 stacks, so Quina itself will get plus 40% attack, initial brave and max brave. At a full 10 stacks, Quina's brave damage is guaranteed to be maximum each time he does brave damage. Now going over his kit on the left hand side of the slide, his 15 CP is a standard single target brave and HP attack, does some splash, does some self battery, and it provides Quina itself with a frame buff that provides additional stats. Using his S1 also provides one stack of his frog drop. Quina's 35 CP when used will first battery the entire party before doing an AoE brave and HP damage. If Quina's frog drop overhead reaches 10 stacks, this will become the plus version instead and will deal considerably higher damage. Quina's EX is actually pretty interesting on top of the damage it does. Firstly, it cancels enemies break status so it is guaranteed going to re-break the enemies. Does an AoE brave and HP damage. It provides a framed buff 
that not only provides further stat boost to the party, and this is the interesting thing, Quina's EX buff also provides an EX charge up, similar to how Selfie's aura works. And this actually stacks with Selfie's aura EX recast charge up. This means that if you happen to have Selfie's aura and you can access it through a call ability, if you have an EX, I believe, at 2 out of 3. And if you have Quina's EX buff up as well, your EX will charge considerably faster. And this is one of the ways how the so called Quina and Ultimacia combo works. Ultimacia's combo normally requires 3 skill users for her to reach a full EX. And at a full EX, it allows her to get 2 free instant turns and 2 free ability users. However, if Ultimacia has both an aura buff from Selfie up as well as Quina's EX charge up, she gets a full recast bar, a full EX meter I should say, just after 2 skill users, which actually allows you to go EX, skill use, skill use, EX, skill use, skill use, um, indefinitely for the entire fight. Quina's LD debuffs a trap that lasts for 6 turns. As with all traps, it triggers when enemies take a turn and the trap takes down. It does actually very nice damage, it does 5 HP dumps and the traps will automatically deal max brief damage if Quina's frog drop overhead is at 10 stacks. Finally, Quina's PT and this is really I think the main reason or maybe the number one reason why Quina is very popular. Now, it lasts only for 5 turns, so that's one of the drawbacks. You really need to find a way to capitalize on a short duration. However, on top of the buffs it gives to the party, which very quickly is HP damage cap up plus 30%, brief gains plus 50%. But the really, really interesting thing is that Quina's PT Aura allows you to automatically deal maximum HP damage regardless of how much brief you have when you deal your attack. So even if say the enemy has null brave damage and all your brave damage does zero, you will still be dumping maximum HP damage. This is a very popular way to get around high defenses and brave damage resistances in fight because with this PT aura, it no longer matters how much brave damage that you do or how many brave hits that you do before the HP dump, you will still do the maximum rate numbers HP damage when you finally dump your brave. When Quina's BT aura is up, Quina's S1 changes also from, I think it was initially eat, now changes to cook, which doubles the HP dumps to 12 instead. So that's really massive damage, and I guess it's a way for Quina itself to contribute to the party's damage during BT time. Quina's force attack will also re-break all enemies and will battery the party. During Quina's force time, your brave damage and brave cap up is plus 50%, which I actually don't think is really needed if you have Quina's BT aura up. But it does play into his first conditional. So the first conditional is you need to do at least 999 brave damage, which should be an automatic given how Quina's kit works, and you get plus 30% for that. The next depends on the number of stacks on Quina's frog overhead, and you get plus 4% per stack, so that caps out at plus 40%. Pretty decent overall, but really the main allure to Quina is the fact that he gives you sort of automatic max brave damage, and now for the first time automatic max HP damage as well. There's really a lot of characters that can abuse this, and the fact that it is pretty unique so far to Quina, but at least for the max guaranteed HP damage. My plan here is really to go for gems, pulling for Quina. So this part of the video, I'll be covering my thoughts and opinions on which characters to go for if you're short on resources. As always, there's going to be two categories here. The first category is the good value category, which are characters that I think will provide you good value regardless of who else you really have on your roster. And the role fulfillment category, which are characters that are decent or good, but you may or may not need them depending on you know, who else you really have built on your roster. 
doesn't come as a surprise if you've listened to me go on about these characters but I really think both Ares and Quina fall into the good value category and between the two my pick will actually be Ares more than Quina just because of the fact that Ares is a very well-rounded character that provides so much utility in one. She is also one of the very rare echoes that doesn't deal damage which actually makes for a very good force echo user and the fact that she can now mitigate damage, provide you debuff immunity on top, really teases a large number of Shinryu fights. I think one of the stages is actually Hell House itself. Quina, on the other hand, I think is on this category because of the fact that what Quina provides is pretty unique. The main two attraction is firstly on a smaller scale the EX buff that makes everyone's EX charges faster. And like I mentioned earlier, there's the Ultimisia Quina combo that really abuses this. But more importantly, the fact that Quina's PT aura allows you to automatically deal maximum HP damage regardless of how much brave damage that you do. This kind of utility is pretty insane. I mean, the whole point of bringing aura bot supports in the first place is to max out your damage. And Quina just automatically sets your damage to the highest possible. So really that's saying a lot. No, plus it's Quina. There is one thing I want to mention. Raijin is a secondary featured character of one of the banners. And I do recommend pulling at least for Raijin LD. So that you get access to the LD call ability. Raijin's LD call lands a 2 turn debuff. And while the enemy is debuffed by this. Any HP damage that they deal is reduced by 100%, so essentially zero. And the enemies won't be able to land debuffs while debuffed with Raijin's debuff. While the duration is short at two turns, it's a very good overall defensive call ability that really shuts down a large number of fights, particularly if you deny the boss's turns. Finally, Quick mention about Zack, I think he fits into the role fulfillment category. He's pretty decent, you know, his damage is okay, he's good. He does have some tanking capabilities, especially tied to his PT. But really, you know, he's really released in the time when there's a lot of powerhouses being released. And for many characters, now you really also want to pull for their BT and max it out. So it's really difficult and challenging to find resources for Zack. And really, you know, majority of players would have pulled for Ruby Kante anyway. And like I said earlier in the video, if you have Ruby Kante, there's really not a lot of reason to pull for Zack any longer. Ruby Kante will fulfill all your tanking needs and, and then some. So unfortunately, Zack is a victim of poor timing of release, really. So that's it for this video. Took a little bit longer this time. In summary, I will be going straight gems for both Aries BT and Quina. I'll be skipping Zack, and needless to say, I'll be skipping Kamalona as well. I already did have Kamalona fully built anyway, but even if I didn't, I wouldn't pull for him. Thanks so much for watching, I hope this video has been helpful. And if you are enjoying the content, do leave a like, comment, and subscribe, because it really helps a lot. Till then, I'll see you guys in the next pull plan video. Bye!